players gather to cast powerful spells, some of the oldest and most powerful in history of Magic the Gathering, Triumph of St. Catherine, Green Sun Zenith, and Tendrils of Agony, and many others, battling head to head in brutal combat. They all have one thing in common, to uphold their legacy in the search for eternal glory. The Eternal Glory Podcast is brought to you by the minds behind Bosch and Roll on YouTube, Thraben University, and TheEpicStorm.com. This episode is sponsored by 3 for 1 Training and Sparks Law Practice. Hello, and welcome to episode 118 of the Eternal Glory Podcast, Sleepers from Karlov Manor. We've already recorded 30 minutes of introduction and banter for the week, available in our supporter-exclusive pre-show. Check out patreon.com slash eternalglory to gain access, or join as a YouTube member for the same content on YouTube instead. You won't want to miss our thoughts on the CEDH drama of the week. As always, I'm Phil Gallagher, aka Thraben U. I am Brian Koval, aka Bosch and Roll. And I am Brian Cook of the Epic Storm. Shout out to our new members since the last episode. We've got Drummer Boy No, Willie N, Corey, Slayer596, cool parents, by the way, to name you Slayer, Michael V, Russ G, and Sam KR. Bunch of new members since the last one. Shout out to all of you, and you all get to enjoy our hot takes about foolish Twitter discourse. This episode is brought to you by Sparks Law, a business transactional law firm owned by Eternal Magic community member Jonathan Sparks. If you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or gig worker looking to start your own company, Sparks Law can help you with partnership agreements, contract reviews, intellectual property production, or other business legal questions. If you want to shape up your business strategy with a fellow eternal gamer, reach out via email to jsparks, that's J-S-P-A-R-K-S, at sparkslawpractice.com, or call 470-268-5234. This episode is also sponsored by 3 for 1 Trading. 3 for 1 Trading is one of Europe's leading Magic the Gathering traders. Their online shop has a fantastic selection of high-end Magic cards, especially for vintage, legacy, and old-school players. You can find them at shop3 trading.com or visit their booth at major events. They run weekly sales, and new, individually scanned, high-end cards are added every Wednesday. Use code ETERNALGLORY to gain our community-exclusive offer of free worldwide shipping on your first order over $500 and experience their world-class customer service and exact grading for yourself. And if you want to advertise to our 10,000-plus Eternal Gamers every episode, reach out to us. We're always accepting new sponsors. Before we get started here, we got some major Magic the Gathering news today. After waiting for so long, the Warhammer 40k cards are finally coming to Magic Online tomorrow. Brian, do you want to tell us what's going on with those? Because the release is a little interesting. Yeah, so this was difficult for a long time to get these cards on Magic Online. As all legacy gamers know, we all want our Triumph of St. Catherine. We'd love to play the deck that won Eternal Weekend. How about that, please? And now we get the chance to get it. However, the thing that held this back for so long was, uh, to my understanding, legal dickering between Wizards of the Coast and Games Workshop. And whatever happened behind the scenes that I have no information on, I'm sorry, but it has resulted in these cards will only be available from February 21st to April 5th and only available if you buy the full commander deck that they are contained in. These precons will be in the store. So if you want to just you know, buy for the one that has Triumph of St. Catherine in it, you're good. You don't have to go scrambling to find it. But these cards will not be dispersed into treasure chests at any point. They won't be released any other way. And here's like a crazy thing that really sent me for a loop. They also won't be available during open access. So even when you have that God account for 30 bucks for the month or whatever that they've been doing a lot lately, you cannot use these cards in that environment. My understanding is that hands are tied on the release of these for air quotes reasons. Wizards of the Coast and Magic Online cannot do any better than that. If you ever want to play with these cards, you should probably buy those commander decks. Brian, when I heard the news, you were literally the first person 
question that I thought of and I went to go message you, but there's already tweets out there being like, oh my God, Bosch and Roll, trying to St. Catherine. You're finally going to get to play with Kathy. How excited are you? I'm pretty stoked. And yeah, I got tagged like nine times on the Magic Online announcement. I had already copied it into my Discord and retweeted it and people were still tagging me in the original one. And I appreciate the look. So uh, don't worry, folks. I heard and I'm ready. I have had a set of uh, decks for the channel just in the bank. I actually like I just pulled up my spreadsheet. Not that anyone can see it, but I'm narrating my my life right now. My spreadsheet where I track uh, what decks I have coming up. I have a bunch of them highlighted in blue that I've just had in like a little thing that I've kicked down the can. Uh, kick the can down the road multiple times. They're all the Warhammer decks. And these some of these people donated over a year ago. And they're just like, yep, whenever it's ready. And I check in every few months. I'm like, you know, I'm still holding this money you sent me. Uh, are you still happy with waiting? Whenever it's ready, it's ready. So these people will finally get unlocked. I have a bunch of them in the queue. And uh, I am excited to jump right into Warhammer starting uh, tomorrow afternoon at the time of this recording. It'll already be out there by the time you're all hearing this. All right, but Warhammer isn't our primary topic of the day. We're actually going to be revisiting murders at Karlov Manor. This is a set that I wasn't particularly hyped for. Like when I saw the full spoiler, I, I ordered two cards from this set for my collection, and uh, I'll, I'll probably pick up a third at Magicon Chicago, but I, I was kind of underwhelmed by the set. And as it turns out, I think we as a magic community undervalued some of these cards. So we wanted to loop back to some of these cards and show how they are being played and sort of reevaluate them now that we've seen them in action. Jumping into these surveillance, is that where we want to start? Yes, I am so excited to talk about these. You have no idea. Okay. Uh I'm going to I'm going to just set the stage and then let Bryant go off because he is bouncing in his chair. He's so hyped about this. This is a full cycle of 10 color pair dual lands and they're actually land dash mountain forest they have the land types they are proper duels they all enter the battlefield tapped they all surveil one when they enter the battlefield which is look at the top card of your library you may put it in your graveyard okay bryant go off king what's on your mind when this set first dropped i usually place an order from a website where you can get japanese cards and i bought a full 40 set of these lands going like yeah they'll probably be playable in modern like they're comparable to triomes right like i think that those are the most realistic comparison to these surveil lands so the question is is drawing a card for three mana better than a free surveil like that's ultimately what it comes down to and obviously it's two versus three colors but they're both searchable with fetch lands and at a surface level neither of those lands seem incredibly strong like you don't see a lot of legacy deck with triomes not that they can't it's just it's not the average it's few and far between so i recorded a modern video i know modern uh with these surveil lands and they were incredible i played two so i decided that maybe i would try one in legacy i told someone that i work on decks with and they were just like lol good luck buddy seems terrible i went four and one and i searched out the under city sewers the blue black underground c one a ton and i was just like i don't know man i think that this has legs i'm gonna try out two and they were just like good luck let me know how tap lands are in your combo deck i 5 would that league playing two and it was just so good and then i had this idea of like well what if you played cards with graveyard synergies with these surveil lands and as the storm guy echo of aeons you could also do past in flames there's a lot of ways that you can build this so i did echo of aeons and with brainstorm you can put that surveil trigger on the stack cast your brainstorm and then put that card you want to the graveyard i see that phil has placed a note in our show notes about worldly tutor that's something that's been popping up with the golgari reanimator decks you heard me correctly golgari reanimator because what you do is you search out the black green surveil land and in response to that surveil trigger you cast worldly tutor you just built your own entomb and that means that these golgari decks have essentially eight entombs in their deck so you can go get that silver bullet but also also in post board games, there are all most of these black green decks are also playing the Witherbloom command combo now. That means that you have a tutor for your sideboard juke, and these decks are just so much more consistent now than they've ever been in the past, and they dodge graveyard hate quite well. So I think these surveil lands are adding consistency to combo decks without taking up deck slots, and that's exactly what these glass cannon style decks ended up needing. And it's a really, really exciting time to be a combo player right now. So I, I think I want to walk this back to the conceptual level for a minute. I think when people evaluated these lands, they went ETB land bad. 
ETB tapped land bad. And usually by legacy standards, that that's just correct. And in order to be playable in legacy, a tap land needs to offer a ton of utility or value. Think your Bojuka bogs and your cloud posts of the world. And you have to think, what is the value of a single surveil trigger? What is the value of one Dragon's Rage Channeler trigger? A lot of times in Legacy, the answer is coming in untapped is much more important than that one card. But if that one card you're putting in the graveyard is an Echo of Eons, is a Grizzlebrand, and instead these things are becoming part of an engine, they are becoming more than just one random card surveilled, and they are fueling some graveyard-based nonsense, these are conceptual game changers, not just an ETB tapped land with a minor upside. Wait, Phil, I have a question. So you're playing one or two, right? But I think it's the wrong way to look at it. I mean, most legacy decks, and I'm not going to say all, but most have fetch lands in them. So it's like you're playing a pioneer mana base where you actually get to play a bunch of surveil lands, but you get to search for them. So even just playing one makes your entire mana base more consistent, and it's like you're playing nine, ten of them. So you just have that option of the surveil at any point in the game where your third underground seer or your fourth tundra would have done nothing. Yeah, and like decks like Brian plays have been doing this with Mystic Sanctuary for the past year or two, right? Where every fetch land come the end game represents that terminus back on top of library or whatever it is you need in in the late game. The ability to turn a random fetch land into a surveil maybe ends up being half of a combo piece if you pair it with brainstorm, ponder, worldly tutor, whatever. That's actually huge. Yeah, my uh, slogan, Island Ponder Keep, keep any hand that could cast Ponder. What the, the real root of that is, is I will keep a hand that gives me options moving forward in the game. If I need spells, I'll find them. If I need lands, I'll find them. And now the fact that any fetch land on turn one does one third of a Ponder is kind of nuts. Because a lot of the times I'll keep a one lander that just has an island, a ponder, and then a bunch of three drops. And it's like, if this ponder hits two lands, I'm cooking. But if I can just keep a hand with two lands and no ponder, and my first fetch gets card selection, lands are always going to be the densest thing in my deck, the densest individual card type. Usually I'm I'm doing math where it's like, oh, I play 21 lands. There's one in my opening hand, you know, slightly better than one in three cards. And my deck right now is a land. And if I see two cards before I have to play my next land just for free baked into something I was going to do anyway, that's extremely powerful. And one thing, I think the reason that these went under the, the radar at first is it's hard to imagine how good Surveil 1 is just in general. Like, uh, consider Surveil 1 draw a card. That's not a card that sees a lot of play other than in special cases like Doomsday that's specifically trying to rip through their deck or Pioneer Phoenix that... A, doesn't have a better cantrip to play, and B, actually uses its graveyard. There's not a lot of spots where Surveil actually comes up in competitive play. And we have a full 10 cycle of these exact lands that don't Surveil one. Just Mountain Forest, ETBs tapped, is a card that exists. There's a whole cycle of them. They were draft commons in, I think, Dominaria. Call time is snow, and then there's another after it. I think it is Dominaria United. Yes, there's a full snow cycle of these, and there's a full non-snow cycle of these. And the only difference between those commons and these rares is surveil one which wizards of the coast correctly identified in their their testing they played a lot with these before they released them and we can we can kind of read what wizards thought of this too based on the rarity like putting dual lands in multiple sets as a full 10 cycle as commons just in the basic land slot to make draft work better and then these straight up to rare because they added surveil one to them they knew what they were doing and it took us it didn't take long once we saw them in action we all got on it and some people were trying them but this did not jump out to me on the spoiler as wow these are gonna conceptually change what a fetch land means in all eternal formats when i originally saw these i i went to like theros block conceptually as my mental shortcut and i started thinking of like temple of deceit and all the cards from that cycle where they etv tapped and they scried one and i was like ah, eh, these cards are kind of garbage but throwing the land types on them so that they became fetchable and switching scry to surveil like those are two major major power-ups the card going to your graveyard is so frequently an upside due to things like uh, reanimation and delve in particular yeah almost all decks these days use their graveyard as a resource 
in some capacity, whether it's Uro, Life from the Loam, Past in Flames, uh, Delve, Delirium. There's very few decks that actually don't care about their graveyard at all. And I think the, the Temple Cycle would actually, we would have figured this out 10 years ago if those were. Uh, decks or cards with land types, we would have been fetching to scry one for 10 years. We would still play those. But I also do think you're right. The surveil is more powerful than scry. So the other thing about these lands is that since they have the basic land type, they qualify you for things that interact with those land types. Most notably here, days. Let me tell you, surveil one, days, surveil one, days, surveil one, days has happened to me in a game of legacy already. And these cards have been in the card pool for what, a, a week? Is that it? Two weeks? How, how long have these been out? Yeah, not that long. Uh, yeah, it it's like a week and a half, two weeks uh, by the time this video comes out. And and yeah, seeing people pick this up with days, we've seen this happening with Mystic Sanctuary, a card that's already been mentioned once, which is a tech land that is fetchable with a land type. That that came up. That card's banned in modern, just for the record. <laughs> that's how good that one is. And you can't even days in that format. So we've seen the turn on days for additional value in a mid game, even if it's not countering a spell aspect of tech lands with land types. Surveil one is not as good usually as put ponder back on top of your deck or terminus or fourth air legus, depending on how hard you're balling. It's not nothing either. And if you have room to pick this thing up, get card selection, and you don't mind an ETB tap land coming into play multiple times, it's it's a huge upside. I think it's also not necessarily fair to compare these lands to Mystic Sanctuary. I don't think there's going to be too many decks where those cards are competing for slots. Like, you're not building your mana base and going like, oh, do I want my first Surveil Land or Mystic Sanctuary? Because I think the reality is you can afford to play both. Like, a lot of control mana bases have enough lands where you're going to be like, oh, obviously I just cut this other land and I'll play one Surveil Land plus the Mystic Sanctuary. Like, it's just additional value that you're getting out of your mana base, which was the biggest point I had about the combo decks is you now get value in other unexpected areas, and control decks in particular, blue decks I should say, could even play more than one. They could play two or three, depending on how many lands in general that they're playing. I understand that Brian could probably speak to this a little bit better than I can, but like 18 to 21 tends to be pretty normal now, and if you chose to play three, I don't think anyone would scoff at you. I mean, I'm playing two in Storm. I think that these lands are going to be underrated, and then over time you'll just see more and more of them being added to decks. Yeah, there's definitely some critical mass where it's too many tap lands, and you just die versus Delver because you can't play around days on turn two because you, you know, drew a tap land. Uh, that sort of thing needs to be balanced for. But you're right. I released a video. It's coming out tomorrow at time of recording, so it'll be out a few days by the time anyone's listening. Uh, where it was a Uro Exploration Field of the Dead deck. And I have a Hedge Maze in there. That's the the Tropical Island version. And I fetched it basically at every opportunity. Just any time a land was going to come in and I didn't need a mana right away. Just sure. Uh, I play Uros and Loams. Let's put them in the graveyard. That's pretty sick. And card selection, even if I'm not getting card advantage. Because if you mill something like Uro, that's just straight up card advantage. Uh, on your land for free. And I was playing 24 lands in that deck, which is a lot, but it, it's kind of a lands adjacent strategy. And I noticed halfway through the league, I should have Mystic Sanctuary in here. I wasn't playing it because I, I backed off a little because of Hedge Maze and all this other, you know, stuff. But, you know, Field of the Dead wants different names. I got plenty of islands. And you were right that I could have just played them both. And if I revisit that deck, I would have them both in it for sure. Man, I didn't even think about these with Field of the Dead. Like, the ability to add more fetchable lands with different names that can produce the correct color of mana is kind of huge in those, like, 8-mulch-style decks that see Fringe play. Yeah, 8-mulch, or just, you know, put one Field of the Dead in your Uro control deck and let your lands do the talking. Uh, all you gotta do is hit land drops and you'll win eventually. I mean, people were playing, like, a temple garden uh, or or something just a uh, a stomping ground a breeding pool just to make room for or make field of the dead more likely to trigger and hedge maze is way better than breeding pool in legacy brian i remember watching you play at the legacy pit open and you were playing a field of the dead control deck 
with like, I believe you had like two expressive iterations in it back then. Not really the point of this, but like think of how much better that deck is now than it was a year and a half ago or two years ago, probably at this point. Yeah, back then uh, Ragavan was legal. And I still thought Field of the Dead was fine. There's a great video of me just shellacking a Is It Delver player on camera. <laughs> if anyone wants to go find that, uh, it, it was very satisfying. Yeah, the, the format is, I don't want to say slower, but it's about different things now. The things you need to react to on turn one are closer to like Chromox, Ancient Tomb, some Horsaki that Phil put in a deck. Uh, versus like a one drop that you're just going to get dazed out. The one drops now are Delver DRC, that sort of thing. You could take one or three to get some extra card selection. And sometimes all you need to win those matchups is to answer the Delver or the DRC one turn earlier than you did. Or it's like five turns later, you're just in bolt range instead of at six. And getting one card's worth of selection just on the house might flip a lot of those. But also, you know, it might be in your hand when you need to resolve a spell through days and you can't so we'll see how that shakes out i think that one or two is probably the number of these that's going to settle into 2021 land decks and unless you're doing something really special like the worldly tutor engine i don't think we're going to see like 15 16 18 even 18 land combo or tempo decks really embracing these yeah i'm i'm kind of of the the same mind when you think legacy if you're going to name one legacy deck the deck that you say is delver right the further you drift towards late game value town ETB tapped lands, the more Delver can punish you in that early game. So I, I am in agreement. One or two of these in a legacy mana base seems fine. Although I think that if you're in less powerful formats where games are a little slower, cranking up the numbers on these is probably good or at least not unreasonable. Now, that's actually an interesting thing. And I mean, we're a legacy pod, so we won't spend too much time on this. But the only formats where fetch lands intersect with these are vintage legacy and modern because Pioneer doesn't have fetch lands. I think fetching these in Pioneer would actually be not so busto. And I think having too many of these in your deck, I actually think modern is faster and more unforgiving than legacy right now. I think modern is probably due for a violent outburst ban, personally. Uh, but and while I think legacy is healthy and, and largely balanced, we'll see if modern is actually low enough power compared to legacy that these really show up in higher numbers. But I would suspect one to three uh, landing around two most of the time will be the number we see in both legacy and modern of fetch land mana bases. So I, I think before we move on from these, I just want to hammer one thing home about like the reanimator worldly tutor deck for years in tomb has been the best card in that deck there's lots of good ways to get things out of the graveyard but in tomb was just the best way to get the things into the graveyard especially the specific thing that you wanted and the worldly tutor plus surveil land combo is just more in tombs it's more of the best card in the deck you have to work a little bit harder to make it work, but it's not that much harder. Right. And I will also take this opportunity to remind people that Entomb was banned for a while. Getting Entomb 5 through 8, even if you have to jump through a hoop, you're unlocking the best version that's ever existed of this effect. But I think the real kicker here is the sideboard juke. Like, it makes your your plan Bs better. And that's part of the reason why Reanimator is all over the Legacy Leagues right now. Like, if you're playing a Legacy League right now, I wouldn't be shocked if facing Reanimator twice was the average. I've been playing a ton this week, and I've had multiple leagues where I faced Reanimator or Rescaminator or whatever name you want to call those decks three plus times. Like, it's tough to get through a league without facing Turn 1 Grief. I think Reanimator has this thing going for it right now where there's enough different builds of it that people don't know quite what you're going to be doing. Like, let, let's pick Blue Black Reanimator, for example. Some of those builds just have a creature beatdown plan in the sideboard. Some of those builds have show and tell in the sideboard so you don't necessarily know whether you're expecting big creatures to come from hand or if you're going to be get beat down by like true name nemesis brazen Bor borrower and doubt voidwalker and sometimes if you lose game one quickly you might not even know what colors your opponent is on and if they are on this green black reanimator deck list 
that's something entirely different. And now the Witherbloom Apprentice chain of smog is an entirely different angle that you have to respect. And all these different angles are backed up by things like grief you, reanimate grief you again, take your two best pieces of react, uh, interaction. Do we have anything else to say about surveil lands or can we go on to my new best friend and, and bed partner? You like that card, Brian? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. What a surprise. We're talking about Cryptic Coat. Let me read this one for the the people at home. Two and a blue artifact dash equipment. When Cryptic Coat enters the battlefield, cloak the top card of your library, then attach Cryptic Coat to it. To cloak a card, this is reminder text, to cloak a card, put it onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 two -two creature with ward 2. Turn it face up at any time for its mana cost if it's a creature. So cloak is manifest, but the thing also has ward 2, which is kind of a cool balancing thing that wizards added to uh, face down cards because ward two means that your face down two two that usually cost like around three mana if we're comparing it to morphs or things that have traditionally manifested is easily answered by a one mana effect and putting ward two on it means it costs three mana to answer your three mana face down two two which i think is a really clever way to balance that good job wizards but okay so this is manifest with ward two that's just what the the mechanic is and then back to reading cryptic coat Equipped creature gets plus one, plus zero, and can't be blocked. And then for one and a blue, return Cryptic Coat to its owner's hand. Thing that is really cool about this card that might not be noticed right away, it does not have an equip ability. You cannot just make a different creature unblockable and get plus one, plus zero. This can only attach itself, without help of you know another card, can only attach itself to the thing that it manifests when it enters the battlefield. I was playing uh, some sort of fair blue deck in modern the first time i saw this card i didn't even know like i didn't even see it on the spoiler it didn't come through my twitter feed had no idea of its existence and somebody tutored for was so unfortunate mystic and i immediately understood that i was dead because this card is the fact that it's a three drop means that answering the stoneforge mystic does not stop this thing from arriving on the following turn it makes it counterable but at that point like what is your removal spell actually better pointed at the face down two two or the stoneforge and then as soon as they have more mana they can just pick up the coat. It leaves the 2-2 ward behind. That might be a creature under there. And then the next three mana gets them another one. Like it costs Batter Skull eight mana to pick up and put back down. And that is a viable end game in Control Mirrors for Stoneforge decks. This costs five mana to pick up and put back down. It gets going so much faster and it generates actual card advantage where Batter Skull, if you pick it up, the germ dies. You're not getting card advantage. You're just protecting your Batter Skull. This poops out a 2-2 every single time. I mean, this is kind of like true name nemesis that might be bigger and might have more true name nemeses coming it's a, a very exciting card and that's not even talking about yet what might be in that coat and uh if you've ever watched anything i've ever made you'll know that the second winningest card in the history of my channel after uro titan of nature's wrath is phyrexian dreadnought and that's somehow true <laughs> some somebody in my patreon uh read through all my archive and tallied up all my trophies and figured out what cards won the most after uro it's phyrexian dreadnought and this is not only a new way to cheat it into play, but a freaking good one. So as far as where I've seen this C play, I've seen two 5-0 finishes with Stoneblade, a 5-0 with Painter, Stifle Knot, and 8-cast. I have also seen this as a finisher in some control decks and as a Stoneforge Mystic target in a Cephalid Breakfast deck as well. This is not a card that currently has a lot of legacy-specific finishes. Like, there's, like, the five that I just read that I could find. But this is one of those things that when I have seen it on the other side of the board, it makes me nervous. Right. And it's just, if two mana's up, you can't kill this thing. And if you spend mana to get through the war trigger on the thing that's holding it that might have been a land or it might have been a row we don't know until it's too late and you spend your your effort on nothing and then they just pick up the coat and now they put another thing under it you have to actually answer the coat but it comes with built-in protection because it can bounce itself it puts you in a really tough spot and in addition to all of the normal things we've said so i think level zero of this card is it can make a 2-2 every turn and the most recent one is a 3-2 unblockable. Level one of this card is, well, what if it's a cool thing underneath? And then somewhere around level three or four of this card is, how can we abuse it if it's not a creature underneath? Because there's some crazy rule stuff that happens here too. If you manifest something 
And I'm thinking about self-lit breakfast here because Phil mentioned seeing it. If you accidentally manifest your dread return and it's just stuck as a face down 2-2 instead of as a combo piece, you can use Teferi to bounce your manifest creature or your cloaked creature and return dread return to your hand. You can also, if you accidentally manifest or cloak, I should just say cloak. If you just, if you cloak something like Teferi or a land, like a non-creature permanent, and you ephemerate the cloaked creature, it comes back as whatever's on the front side of that. The rules don't care how it got there. That's cool. I like that. I haven't made room in one of these shells for ephemerate yet. Cloaking a solitude, then ephemerating it into a solitude is nuts. Uh, cloaking a Teferi, and then like your opponent's mid-combo, and suddenly you have Teferi or something that makes their combo not work. Like flickering a cloaked creature, and it turns into Teferi in response to Beseech the Mirror. Yeah, retweet to scare a Storm player. Like these sort of things are live. And I, I mean, the ephemerate stuff borders on cute. I don't know where you're going to find the deck slots to do that in a legacy deck where you got other problems to solve. I'm just saying this is wide open for as wild as you want to get with it. Yeah, I, I have non-ironically played face down red Acroma and flicker wisped it before. Like that is a thing that I have done. That is a thing that I have seen have tournament results. I have not seen a card become uncloaked yet, and I have played against this card, uh, I don't know, maybe four times at this point. Not outside the realm of possible, and if you are building a deck that is built around Cryptic Coat and actually has, like, four of these fuckers in it and ephemerates and, like, I don't know, surveil lands or brainstorms to help set up cloaking the proper thing... You can get spicy. One thing that I noticed watching another person play Magic Online is their opponent played a cloaked creature. And at the end of the game, they were like, oh, I wonder what it was. And the game log just tells you what it was because like Morph, you have to reveal your manifest morphed whatever creatures and it revealed what the card was. Right. That is built into the rules. If you're playing with this card in paper, if a face down permanent would leave play, you do have to reveal what it was. Uh, even if you cloak your Dread Return and try to bounce it with Teferi, you do have to show your opponent it was Dread Return as it leaves play. This is a holdover from when Morph was the only face down thing, and it was just a, a built in rule to make sure that that was actually a Morph creature and you weren't just Attacking taking three mana to play a land. <laughs> yeah, right. So revealing face down things both at the end of the game and when they leave play is part of the rules engine. So, you know, play that correctly. Don't get in trouble. Um, and in terms of evaluating the ward, I just want to uh, draw attention to creatures from 8-cast. Keep in mind how annoying Patchwork Automaton is to remove, right? Where your removal is forced off curve on that creature. And same with Kappa Cannoneer. Like, it's a super feel bad to get time walked by Kappa Cannoneer a couple of times and then finally pay five mana to remove that creature. When your removal oftentimes costs three times as much and you have to wait a turn or two to use it, like, that's a lot of unblockable damage you can get in. Patchwork Automaton, aka Patches O'Hulahan. If you could dodge a wrench, you could dodge a ward trigger. That card is really difficult to beat uh, on the turns where you need to beat it. Yeah, the, the joke, if you could dodge a wrench, you could dodge a ward trigger. Remember, tri ward is a triggered ability in paper. It's a triggered ability on Magic Online too, but it just happens. So if you have some cloaked cards, make sure you make your opponent pay the two if they try to target it with stuff. Uh, don't forget. One other rules thing that I want to talk about, because I learned this the hard way, is uh, traditionally played white sideboard cards might not line up well with Cryptic Coat in your deck because although the face down 2-2 kind of feels uh, intellectually like a token, it's actually a creature coming into play from your library, which means that Containment Priest will exile it and Graft Digger's Cage will stop it from happening. I curved Containment Priest straight into Cryptic Coat and just exiled the top card of my deck. Love Live that. on paper. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, it was just like... I was like, wait, where'd that go? What just happened? And then, you know, oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. And that does affect how you build your sideboards now. I've been finding other solutions than Containment Priest and Graft Digger's Cage to deal with those decks if my deck is heavy on Cryptic Coat. So just keep that in mind as well. How about this next card? Leyline of the Guild Pact. I saw a lot of tweets when this card was spoiled, like, does nothing, LOL. And all of a sudden, modern... The RCQ was turned upside down with this Domain Rhinos deck, 
And then the next day, I got paired against Domain Rhinos and Legacy, and I'm now seeing, you know, cards that you would typically see in Modern come to Legacy, like Sign of Draco, and it looks pretty impressive. I see that Phil's put some numbers down here. I'll let Phil read those for you. Well, does someone want to read the card first? Oh yeah, we should probably do that. This card costs four mana, and let me do my best to explain the four mana it costs. It is four green hybrid and each one is hybrid with one of the other colors. So you can cast it for GGGG or white, blue, black, red, or you could replace any of the white, blue, black, red with a green, but it costs four mana and uh, it's air quotes mono green, but it uses all the other colors too. Uh, kind of a weirdo. If Leyline of the Guild Pact is in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield. Each non-land permanent you control is all colors. Lands you control are basic land types in addition to their other types. The basic interactions here, uh, we're pretty familiar with a lot of them because we're doing domain stuff with Beanstalk anyway. Lands you control are every basic land type. Okay, I started the game with Leyline of the Guild Pact. I can Leyline Binding off of a basic forest on turn one. Just send it. Brian, do you know any other turn one plays you can make? Ponder, baby. Uh, you could do that right off of a, a Plains uh, or a Fetch Land. Uh, it's pretty cool. A thing that I want to point out here, uh, each non-land permanent you control is all colors. This only affects things in play. We don't have to do like the painter servant mental gymnastics of like, oh, they can pitch anything to force of will now because that's not true. It only affects non-land permanents that are in play. The thing that really jumped this off though is the interaction with Scion of Draco, which has been a modern domain zoo card for as long as it's existed. That deck moves from like, tier one five to tier three depending on what's going on in the format but it's always been around and now it's back in a big way sign of draco 12 mana artifact creature just 12 the number 12 artifact creature dash dragon domain the spell costs two less to cast for each basic land type among lands you control it has flying and each creature you control has vigilance if it's white hexproof if it's blue lifelink if it's black first strike if it's red and trample if it's green so if you were to start the game, hypothetically, with all of your permanents being all colors and all your lands being all land types, Sign of Draco is a two mana 4-4 four, four flying vigilance hexproof lifelink first strike trample. Wait, Brian, you said this costs 12? I do, yeah. So question, is that more than five? Uh, it's significantly more than five. Uh, and that might interact with uh, Up the Beanstalk a little bit, which also interacts with Leyline Binding, a card that I've already mentioned now costs one off of any land. You know what else is pretty messed up? When you back up your freaking zoo deck with Force of Will, which also costs five. And you know what else is crazy? I haven't actually seen anyone do this yet, but I know it's going to happen to me sooner than later. If this costs two, Phil, are there any three drops in the format that would like to have a 12 man artifact laying around? Broadside, baby. Yeah, uh, you're dead. GG. That is uh, turn two or turn three, attack for six, fling for 14. We're done. That's 20. I, I have already theory crafted lists. I don't remember if I have actually done this or if I've just talked to people about it already, but uh, it is it is enticing. I also have some challenges to bring that brew together in my queue, and I generally don't enjoy zoo style magic, but I am very hyped for that. Put that sign of Draco right in that cannon send it for what it's worth i think that i faced this deck at least in legacy the version with leyline binding sign of draco up the beanstalk and leyline of the guild pact you could say it's a zoo deck but honestly it felt more like control with a baneslayer angel that costs two mana uh, at least from my side of the table it didn't seem like it was an over aggro deck but on turn two they had a four four flying vigilance lifelink all the good stuff and i was just like this is incredibly powerful and i imagine when they open on Leyline of the Guild Pact into turn two Sign of Draco, Delver has a really tough time winning. Like, it just seems like you get to bully the Delver player over and over with your Baneslayer Angel. There's a whole spectrum of decks being built here. I have played against what you just described, which is just Beanstruck Control with a Baneslayer Angel. I have played against actual Wild Nakatl, just curving out into a Domain Zoo. The Territorial Kabu. I've seen, uh, which is a 5-5 five, five automatically off any two lands uh, when you have the, the ley line in play. And also, like we're talking a lot about ley line being in play. It's pretty easy to get domain mana with fetch land mana base. Just one triome, one duel, we're there. Maybe one surveil land. One surveil land, there we go. Like I've seen the spectrum of it from zoo with force backup to beadstock control with Baneslayer Angel. Various flavors in between. 
And it's kind of spooky when if your opponent turns zero as a ley line, you don't know which side you're playing against yet. A couple things I want to talk about. Let's start with Scion without the ley line. When you don't have the ley line, like let, let's say you have Triome into dual land and you just play it on turn two. If you play a turn two, four, four flyer, that's kind of mid, right? Like that, that is unexciting. That is not a card that you are going to expect to win you a game of magic on its own. It might be good against, you know, a, a starting Delver or something like that, but it is prone to regular removal. It is also prone to artifact removal. With the Ley Line, it's a scary card that's hard to answer because of the Hexproof. Without it, it's a Tarmogoyf with Evasion. Not that scary. I've seen a spicy card in Leagues specifically because of this Ley Line of the Guild Pack deck. It's another brand new card, which I should have pulled up on my screen because I'm going to mention it right now. Pick your Poison. That card fucks. Oh, I'm sick of this card already. It's a one green sorcery with three modes. Choose one. Each player sacrifices an artifact, so Scion of Draco. Each player sacrifices an enchantment, Leyline of the Guild Pact. Or each player sacrifices a creature with flying, also hits Scion of Draco, but also Delver of Secrets, Dragon's Reach Channeler, Murktide Regent, anything that Brian wants to win the game with, generally dies to pick your poison. And I think that this card might be a sleeper in this set, just because it has so much utility. And if you're old like me or Brian, you might remember when Pick Your Poison was just Simplify, where each player sacrificed an enchantment, and that's all it did. And now, you know, 20 years later, you know, you have two other modes to choose from. Like, these modal cards are so powerful. Pick Your Poison was the card that I thought was the best card from the set after I read the spoiler. Like, that flexibility for a fair green sideboard card is absolutely insane. And I actually got caught really off guard when someone played one of those against me in Legacy in game one, it just almost always hits something. Like Enchantment hits Urza's Saga, for example. In the Teamer Delver deck, if you go back to Juju Bean's winning list from Eternal Week in Prague, there was a copy of Stern Dismissal. I am seeing it in leagues with Pick Your Poison over Stern Dismissal. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Like, just the ability to be removal or whatever is so much better than just bounce a creature and jam it. Yeah, because the creature you want to bounce is Murktide Regent, and this just kills it. And the enchantments you want to bounce are like Counterbalance or maybe get an extra turn off of an Urza Saga, and this just kills it. Is This one is really nice. It is mercifully a sorcery, which is bad for everyone except Burning Wish players. Uh, you could just, you know, have one of those in the old sideboard for whatever your poison may be, but at least you're not going to get blown out mid whatever on your own turn with this like play urza saga saga enchantment in response to the trigger never even get a mana so we do get to breathe a little bit here compared to a uh a card like i'm forgetting the name of it the one green each opponent's a flying creature uh, instant people were using it to kill merit lage for a while clip wings foul play or foul something foul something sounds right <laughs> i don't know i'm brain farting but you all know what i mean yeah pick your poison is not a good answer to merit lage which is important. This is not just a strict upgrade to those uh, other cards that we've seen do this sort of thing again, but it is a disenchant. Run a foul. Yep, run a foul. That's the one. I know that I've played two, I even considered three copies of run a foul when Merit Lage is big in the metagame, or I'm just a deck that's ice cold to Murktide Regent. And I mean, this is not going to help you much against an instant Merit Lage, but it is still rock solid versus Murktide. So let's let's put some numbers on this. So we were talking about Cryptic Coat, which has like five total finishes in legacy right now leyline of the guild pact and the package that goes with it already has 15 finishes including one challenge top four and another challenge top 16 now that's not bad for some new tech that is emerging but i want to compare this to modern where there are currently 114 modern results as of this morning, when I compiled notes for this episode, and I am recording this on Tuesday the 20th. That's a lot of results, Phil. Yeah, you know, that's you're, you're an order of magnitude up there. There's an extra zero there. I would expect both modern and legacy lists to be refined over the next couple of weeks. Like right now, the legacy lists are people kind of porting things from modern, trying the tech, trying to figure out like, 
Am I a Rhino deck? Am I a Bean deck? Am I both? What is the plan A? What is the plan B? Um, I think we're going to see a lot of polish on this. Yeah, and the modern thing makes a lot of sense. Where in Legacy, I mean, we just talked about, like, is this a zoo deck? Is it a control deck? Do control decks want a card that they have to mulligan for for it to be any good? Is that even, is the juice worth the squeeze to be determined? In modern, Leyline went straight into what is already the best and probably should be banned modern deck, which is Cascade Rhinos. When the best deck in the format gets a card that obviously slots into it on the weekend of a modern Pro Tour qualifier, original Pro Tour qualifier, we got a lot of iteration very quickly. So modern makes a lot more sense there where like Scion of Draco is an air quotes two drop. That doesn't break Cascade, so you can still Cascade into Rhinos. The Ley Lines in your hand. That deck already plays Subtlety and Force of Negation, and then it plays Force of Vigor and Endurance in the sideboard. You get the Atraxa value of pitches to everything on the Ley Line. I saw Louis Scott Vargas tweet from the regional qualifier in Denver that he had Ley Line in his opening hand four times and put it in once because it was just better as something to pitch based on the texture of his hand. Like if you don't have Draco, it's better to protect your Rhinos with Force of Negation and just. Imagine having a ley line where it's like, nope, better in my hand. We've never seen that before. That's actually really interesting. I like that quite a bit. And I imagine that the default mode from players is without thinking to put the ley line in, but choosing not to is just a level of the card that I hadn't considered until you mentioned it. Pitches to everything, and you might not need domain on turn one or two. And just making that decision is really cool texture compared to the other ley lines we've seen, which basically are opening hand or bust. I guess Leyline of Abundance, which ended up banned in Pioneer. That one, the Pioneer and Nykthos decks could cast pretty reasonably and continue up their chain. There are obviously decks that have black mana and are reasonably happy to deploy a Leyline of Void on turn four if they're stable against the decks they would bring that in against. But the idea of actively, I have this and no thanks, it's better in my hand. I don't think we've ever seen before. Um, So I don't have a lot of experience with the modern equivalent of this deck, but when I have played with and against the Rhinos deck, one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of their removal is kind of mid and situational, where it only answers certain things. Fire Ice doesn't kill a lot of stuff. Brazen Borrower is only a temporary answer. Force of Vigor and Fury only get certain things. Whereas when you Leyline Binding, that answers damn near anything. So giving a deck that is fast and powerful and has a couple of different plans good generic removal while slotting in something to support Scion of Draco, which you like anyway, that's a lot of things in the plus column. All right, do we have anything else here we want to say about sort of our sleepers from Murders at Karlov Manor or recent Legacy stuff that we've been seeing? I still think Legacy's healthy and cool and pulling the direction or pulling the format in the direction of Stoneforge Mystic only makes me happier. Uh, If Cryptic Coat adds stone blade to the list of things that we're going to see once every two leagues or whatever rather than once every 10 i like that a lot i like blue stone forge mystic decks stone forge mystic is already the primary selection of backup plan in suffler breakfast because of its resilience to orcish bowmaster this gives blue decks a thing to do that doesn't die instantly to bowmaster and is powerful and proactive versus the initiative i for one welcome our new cryptic coat overlords and i'm looking forward to some honest mid-range island ponder gaming yeah every couple of days i see someone with a post like ban name sticker goblin ban ancient tomb ban grief but like i recorded 15 rounds of legacy yesterday and i am here for it and i am loving it i i forgot to mention this in our pre-show i'll i'll do it now but i played sticker goblin muxus in a paper legacy event this past friday i just wanted to flush it out of my system because i'm 10-0 lifetime on magic online i've played it twice i've trophied both and i was like can this possibly be real i took it out in paper and the stickers like actual stickers deterministic amounts of mana that can only be fired once until your name sticker goblin leaves a, a visible zone dramatically change how that deck plays, and I think for the worse. My concern was when I saw how it was implemented on Magic Online, I don't know how much mana I get. Like, I cast this thing, I don't even know if I could play Muxus. That sucks. But actually, the average dispensation of it being five versus you have one five and one six in your 10 card sticker deck, and you can only use it on the first goblin, and then like your next one makes four. Like, you can't just change fives and sixes 
into each other and try to work up the chain, you know exactly what's going to happen and the chain doesn't go any higher. Uh, also, just interactive magic, a lightning bolt on my Sticker Goblin, and then my opponent's ahead under a Beanstalk and they're drawing cards with force. I had a miserable time playing that deck in paper, despite having a blast with it online. Uh, that's just an observation I'm going to drop here that I thought of since we're wrapping up and thinking about Legacy. I'm going to be the old curmudgeon here. I too see a lot of these like Legacy's terrible right now. Ancient Tomb and Grief are everywhere. Sometimes you do have to look at the people saying these things. I tend to try to remove myself a lot of those conversations when my deck is bad because I'm just like, hey, right now is not a good meta for me. I'd rather go play Modern or Pioneer or whatever. But some of these people don't play other formats and Legacy's their identity. It's what they align themselves to. So, of course, they're going to be upset. But I think right now is one of the few times in Legacy where I enter a league and I think it's correct to assume that my opponent is not playing a blue deck. When is the last time that was true? It's pretty rare. Yeah, basically never. So, yeah, people that like playing Island Ponder, I'm not saying that Brian was one of those people, but in general, people that like casting cantrips and making a lot of decisions, they're not in love with Ancient Tomb, Chalice of the Void, you know, uh, Goblin Bombardier or whatever. So, yeah, I understand they're like, well, I didn't get to make any decisions, but like sometimes, you know, you get got or sometimes you face something where your opponent didn't agree to play the same kind of game. That's Magic the Gathering, and it's why we love this game. The idea of I didn't get to make any decisions... You built your deck and you kept your hand at minimum. If your opponent turn one uncounterable Magus in the Moon's you and you don't cast a spell, I don't know. Did you play any dismembers? Can you cycle Orion Revealed for a basic and Hydro Blast that? They, uh, maybe they curved out perfectly and you died, but that's just the game. If you are just losing all games and feel like you've made no decisions, that's already not true. You selected a deck and you kept the hand. Whatever happens from there, uh, you've already made those decisions. I think one of the other interesting things about like pairings right now is your opponent plays Polluted Delta. What deck are they on? That's such a hard question to answer in a vacuum right now. Whereas in previous metagames, it's like, oh, Polluted Delta, this is Doomsday. Polluted Delta, this is Grixis Delver. Right now, someone plays Polluted Delta and I have no idea what they're on and I am waiting for more information. And the fact that there are multiple viable decks that exist in that same blue black x color chunk i think is a great sign of metagame health yep legacy rips 